I recently made videos on Voronism from the Stormlight Archive as well as the planet of Roshar and while I'm happy with what was covered in those videos, I've increasingly become aware of just how deep the Roshar rabbit hole goes. There's just so much to explore in the Stormlight Archive novels and I doubt I'd ever run out of things to talk about. In light of this revelation, I thought I should at least cover more cultural topics from these books. That's when I realized just how much there is to cover when there's so many different cultures on Roshar. Before I can even think about covering more specific topics, I need to at the very least cover some of the major kingdoms that can be found on Roshar. So today, we'll be covering some of the major kingdoms that can be found on Roshar and what makes them unique in both achievement and culture. Before we jump in though, please consider giving this video a like since that's the main way YouTube knows to promote the video. If you'd like to see more Cosmere Lore videos, definitely let me know by liking and commenting down below. And if you're interested in more, then consider subscribing since there's definitely more to come. Also, just a quick shout out to the curators of the Coppermine, the Cosmere Wiki. Without the awesome people over there, videos like this definitely wouldn't exist on the channel. Anyway, let's get to looking at these prominent Rosharan kingdoms. Alethkar is the largest and most prominent of the five Voran nations on Roshar. People from Alethkar are known as Alethi, and their royal colours are blue and gold. Alethkar lies in eastern Roshar, stretching across the entire continent, from the Steamwater Ocean in the north to the Tarat Sea in the southwest. To the east, it leans on the unclaimed hills, while to the south, it reaches the nationless frostlands and the shattered plains, the latter of which it has recently claimed for itself. In the west, Alethka has a long and long disputed border with Yarkaved, which currently follows two rivers and the bend of the Sunmaker Mountains. In the northwest, Alethka borders Herdaz across a stretch of land decided through a few years of border wars. Alethka was founded as Alethala in the Silver Kingdom's epoch. It survived the desolations, but fell under the sway of the hierocracy until the Sunmaker led the kingdom in a successful revolt against the Voran rule. After the Sunmaker's death, his ten sons could not agree on one of their number as his successor. With none of them willing to forego their claim to the throne, they split the kingdom into ten princedoms, which they ruled individually as high princes, with no unifying government. The Alethi people are generally tan, darker skinned than the Vedan, but not as dark as the Makabaki, with dark, typically black hair. They are typically extremely tall, standing on average at least a foot taller than people living further west. In the late era of solitude, the Alithi tan and black hair are considered the general standard of beauty. Multicoloured hair is also present within Alethkar and is an indication of mixed heritage. Some see this as a sign of an impure bloodline, while others use it as evidence of Alethkar's superiority, hard won through conquest. Like all Varan nations, Alethi practice a division between the sexes. Women have safe hands, covered either by a buttoned up sleeve, typical of light eyes, or a glove, typical of dark eyes. They are discouraged from picking up weapons and fighting. By contrast, men are forbidden to read. As such, oftentimes a man and woman will work together as a team in an important position that overlaps both their areas of responsibility, such as the military, with the woman acting as a scribe while the man issues commands. The militaristic nature of the Alethi further influences this divide, leading to most of the Alethi rulers being kings, and women rarely, if ever, becoming high princesses. Alethi discourage emotional openness and any show of what could be perceived as a weakness. An engaged couple keeping close in public is considered, while not obscene, at least extremely improper. Men are encouraged to be combative and forceful, and women to be witty and willing to engage in barbed banter. Unwillingness or inability to act this way can often lead to a person being labelled as inept or stupid. The Alethi culture is divided into two major castes, the light eyes and dark eyes, separated by, as can be surmised, the colour of a person's eyes. The light eyes form the upper caste, with broader rights and privileges, while the dark eyes are the lower working caste. Furthermore, each caste is divided into ten ranks, with the light eyed ranks being called Dans, while the dark eyed ones are called Nans. Some Nans and Dans are hereditary, or stable, while others can only be held by attaining a particular position. The Alethi monarch, for example, is the only person in the country holding the first dan. There are many ways for a person to improve their rankings, such as through marriage or military service. A soldier who becomes an officer will almost automatically be raised to a proper dan or nan along with their children. 
Holding land automatically entitles a light eyes to at least the sixth dan, regardless of their previous status, and becoming a shard bearer entitles at least the fourth dan. The Alethi culture is highly militaristic, stemming from their origins as Alethala. A soldier is considered the highest religious calling, with the fight to reclaim the Tranquiline Halls being believed to be the greatest afterlife one could hope for. The country is almost perpetually at war, if not between the High Princes, then with some external power. Children as young as 12 can, and sometimes are, recruited by raving armies to feed this endless war machine. Military service is one of the more reliable paths of social advancement in Alethka. A soldier can expect to raise in Dan or Nan to match his military rank. Moreover, many dark-eyed soldiers go to war hoping to defeat a shard-bearer and gain ownership of a shard-blade, due to a widespread belief, later proven correct, that bonding a blade would change their eyes to light-coloured. Alethkar is one of the five great Voran kingdoms, with vast majority of their populace worshipping the Almighty. The worship is mostly carried out by the priests called the Ardents. The Ardents, while influential, are not free. Rather, they are slaves to various light eyes. Unlike most other professions, Ardentia is open to both men and women, and to people from all social castes. Ardents are considered genderless from a social standpoint, and as such, many of the Voran taboos regarding gender and gender roles do not apply to them. They are also the only people permitted to use soul casters. Unlike other varieties of Voranism, the Alethi are not required to be personally devout or to perform religious ceremonies. While each citizen is supposed to pick their calling and glory, their goal in life, and the aspect of the Almighty they wish to emulate, the actual religious part of the religion is handled by the Ardent, who perform the requisite rituals and prayers for their masters, so as to reassure them of their righteousness. The Alethi themselves rarely interact with the Almighty, save for an occasional glyph ward or prayer. Located in eastern Roshar, Yarkaved is the second largest state on the planet. It shares its eastern border with the Lethkar and her Daz on three rivers, while in the west it is bordered by two Bela and Triax. North to south, the country stretches across the entire continent, between the Reshi and Tarat seas. Though verdant, Yarkaved doesn't possess many major rivers. The country's most notable geographical feature are the Hornita peaks in the east, which form an important strategic barrier against the Alethi. During the Silver Kingdom's era, the territory now occupied by Yarkaved belonged to the Kingdom of Valav. Since that time, the countries of Tubela and Triax have splintered off, though Yarkaved still holds vast majority of Valav lands, including what was, presumably, its capital, Vedanar, along with its Oathgate. For a long time, Yarkaved was the largest country on Roshar. After Gavilar Kolin unified Alethkar into a single state, the Viren fought a number of small border wars against the Alethi, attempting to test their defences. Though they were eventually pushed back by the forces led by Dalinar Kolin, small conflicts between the Alethi and Viren High Princes continued for many years. Nonetheless, the country remained the main oasis of stability in the region. Much like Alethkar or Karbrant, the population of Yarkaved is divided into Dark Eyes and Light Eyes, with the latter holding power. A number of weaker, lower down noble houses owe fealty to a group of high princes, who in turn owe fealty to a king. Prior to the civil war, known Vedan high princes were Valam, Abriel, Borea, Evanor, and Jalmala. As the largest country, prior to the unification of Alethkar, Yarkaved has strong influence on the culture of other Voran states. The centre of Voran church, the Holy Enclave, is located in the Vedan city of Valath. Valath is also the location of one of Roshar's major spanried hubs, adding to the city's importance. Prior to the civil war, each Vedan high prince maintained their own military. However, it appears that following Caravangian's crowning, the surviving units have all been folded under his command. As the last battle was fought over Vedanar, most of Vedan troops are stationed in the storm bunkers in the city's outskirts. The civil war was catastrophic for them. Many units suffered over 50% casualties. Yet even with those losses, the Vedan military boasts an enormous number of soldiers and powerful fortifications. Entering their territory without sufficient preparations is generally considered to be a horrid idea, bound to mire the potential assailant in years-long conflict and a massive drain on resources. The Vedan people are typically associated with pale skin and violet eyes. Their language belongs to the Voran family and is close enough to that of a Lethgar to be mutually intelligible for both sides. The Alethi are also close to Vedans in fashion. The Vedan are, by and large, Voran, worshipping the Almighty and the Heralds. 
they appear to be more religious than their average warrens, with higher importance being placed on the trappings of the faith, such as the safe hand and the strict division between masculine and feminine arts. In particular, they are noted to be highly respectful and reverent of the ardents, and extremely traditional in the particulars of doctrine. In Vedan families, the sons have two part names, with the latter part being their given name while the former references their order of birth. The first four sons are called Nan, Tet, Asha and Van. Should one of the sons die or be disinherited, his younger brothers all move up a level. For example, Tet Balat becomes Nan Balat. The numerals are used mainly in formal contexts, siblings usually drop them when talking amongst themselves. When a Vedan couple marries, the spouses retain their family names. The children of the couple all use the surname of only one parent. It's unclear whether this is always the father's or if it depends on the parent's relative dance. The Unkalaki, or horn eaters as they are called by outsiders, live on top of the mountains known as the horn eater peaks. They are one of several peoples with singer ancestry and have some attributes that set them apart from other Rosharan humans, such as their unusually strong teeth, which is where the horn eater nickname comes from, and the ability to occasionally hear the rhythms. Red hair is also a typically Unkalaki feature and are a mark of horn eater ancestry on a person from outside the peaks. Though the horn eater peaks are nominally part of Yakovin, the Unkalaki have their own language, system of beliefs and government, and don't seem to see themselves as Vedan citizens. However, the Vedans still claim the right to levy troops from among them in times of war. Thalana encompasses a trio of islands, as well as a small number of islets in the southeast of Roshar, on the ocean known as the Southern Depths. The largest of the three islands is several times bigger than the other two, and appears to be the country's population centre. It's mostly mountainous, with a tall range rising in the middle. The mountains reach all the way to the shore, with towering cliffs making up the northern coasts. The climate is cold and frigid, although the locals find it pleasantly chill. To the north, Thalana is separated from the frostlands by the Longbrow Straits. The nearest countries to it are the city-states of Karbrans to the north and the shallow crypts to the east. With Thalana itself, there are only two known major cities, the capital, Thalan, in a large lake on the northwestern coast, and Kulna, a shipbuilding centre further east. The port city of Amidlatan may belong to Thalana, although it is uncertain. During the heraldic epochs, the islands that now compose Thalana were part of the kingdom of Thalath. The original capital, Thalan city, was likely also the capital of Thalath, as it possesses that state's oath gate. It's unclear when the country broke apart. However, Thalana itself is about 4,000 years old, according to the local tradition. In the era of solitude, Thalana became a titan of commerce, with their ships and caravans trading goods around the world. The country was largely peaceful, with no conflict or war within the past generation. This age of prosperity ended with the coming of the true desolation. The Everstorm dealt massive damage to the country's economy, as Thailand city was devastated, first by the storm itself and then by the local parchment stealing the ships and leaving. Thailand is an elective monarchy. Following the death of a king or queen, an assembly of merchant councils and high-ranking naval officers elects the new ruler, with the current one being Queen Fenrir Namdi. The ruler is said to represent the guilds of Thalana. While the kingdom follows the Varan divisions between Light Eyes and Dark Eyes, there doesn't appear to exist a formalized noble caste analogous to Alethi or Vedan High Princes and High Lords. Rather than Dans and Nans, the Thalan utilize their own system of ranks. The Thalan monarch, however, still claims the first Dan. Thalana appears to have little in the way of a land army, but they do have a long-standing naval tradition famous the world over. Thalan officers are trained in naval tactics and strategy to a far greater extent than their counterparts elsewhere, and their country boasts a large fleet. The kingdom holds five shard blades and three suits of plate, each owned by a different house. The ones who hold the kingdom's shards are referred to as high gods. The Thalan have a system of underwriting trades based around the Thalan Gemstone Reserve in the capital. Each sphere stored there has an owner and an identifying number. People trade the gemstones among themselves using the number however, rather than taking the spheres in and out of the vaults. They leave them inside. The system functions properly so long as people trust the reserve that the money is there, allowing merchants to trade large sums without the usual dangers associated with it. This, along with the existence of span reads to trade over, allows Thalen banks to have wide networks all over the continent, with branches in major cities like Kolonar. 
The Thalen people are tanned, though not as dark as the Reshi, and like most Rosharans, have epicanthic folds. They are typically short, although some can grow as tall as the Alethi. Their most recognizable distinguishing feature are their long white eyebrows, which they sometimes tuck behind their ears. There seems to be no upper limit on how long they can grow, other than sheer practicality. The Thalen men traditionally have white beards, regardless of their age or the color of their hair. The eyebrows are often styled in various ways, such as spikes, bangs or ringlets. To keep them in the desired shape, they are either waxed or starched. Some people shave them altogether, although this is very rare. The eyebrows seem to be of great cultural importance to the Thalens. Even one of their suits of shard plate is decorated with them. The eyebrows of a child of a Thalen and non-Thalen wouldn't be this long, although they would have streaks of white in them. Thalens can be found not only in their native country, but also elsewhere in the world. While many of them are traveling merchants, some Thalens settle in other countries, such as Reshi Isles or Alethgar, permanently. Thalen businesses like tailors and banks can also be found across the continent. The people have a reputation for swindling, but they are not considered particularly warlike. The dominant cultural tradition in Thalena is Alethi Varanism, albeit mixed heavily with local culture and native beliefs. Despite discouragement from the Ardentia, it's common for the Thalen to believe in the passions, a philosophy suggesting that wanting something strongly will draw it to you. Even beyond that, the Thalen stray from the Varan doctrine. Men are permitted to learn to read and women eschew the traditional full sleeve safe hand, instead covering their left hands with long gloves. Some younger women don't cover the safe hand altogether, although this is frowned upon by the more traditional segment of Thalen society. Although this makes them half pagan in the eyes of the Varan countries, the Thalen are nonetheless considered one of the five Varan kingdoms, and their religious authorities are taken into account when the Ardentia as a whole debates. However, there has always been some friction between the Thalens and the church authorities, with the Thalen monarchs often having to go the extra mile to reassure the ardents of their piety. In the present, this has led to some voices in Thalena to call for breaking ties with Varanism altogether. Azir is a landlocked state in southwestern Roshar, in the geographical region known as Makabak. To the southeast, it is bordered by the nation of Imul, along a river that serves as Azir's only way to access the sea. The smaller nations of Tashik, Yezir, and Desh lay to the west, while in the north it shares a long border with Yule. Like most of Makabak, Azir is rather dry and warm compared to the rest of the continent, though it's still cooler than Iri. There are broad plains and few rivers. A vast mountain range stretches across the country's northern and northeastern edge, with a wide pass leading due north to Yule. Azish people belong to the Makabaki ethnic group, members of which can be found across the entire Makabak region. They are described as being short and having dark skin, deep brown, but not true black like some Parshmen. They have a smooth accent like the Imuli. Not much is known about the ancient history of Azir. During the Silver Kingdom's era, it was part of Makabakam, the largest of the Silver Kingdoms. Azamir was likely Makabakam's capital as it contains the Oath Gate. At some point, that country splintered into dozens of states that comprise modern Makabak, including Azir. Sadis, the Sunmaker, the infamous Alethi warrior, conquered Azir as part of his bid to take over the entire continent during the reign of Prime Akasik Snoxil. The occupation was extremely violent. Up to 10% of the country's population died, many of them due to Sadis seemingly seeking to eradicate the Azish. In some areas, Sadis ordered a certain number of executions a day. In others, he declared all men with hair at a certain length to be killed. Sadiz rationalized this by claiming that the Azish were uncivilized since they did not use eye color as a basis for their social hierarchy. Following Sadiz's passing, his kingdom was split between his sons. Without a true ruler, the empire became stretched too thin and the Azish regained their independence. In the centuries since Sadiz's conquest, Azir rose to the position of the cultural and political center of Makabak. Many of the surrounding Makabaki nations became client states to it, leading to the formation of the Azish Empire, a semi-formal name for the group of states led by the prime Akasiks in all international matters. The Azish Empire, despite its name, is closer in nature to a confederacy of states. It is composed of nine member countries, Tashik, Yezir, Imul, Steen, Alm, Desh, Marat, Tukar, and Azir itself. While all of those nations considered the prime Akasiks to be their emperor, 
Other than Azir, they are subject in name only. However, leaders of nations within the empire do follow certain traditional customs. For example, they cannot marry without the prime's permission. In practice, the states typically follow Azir's lead when dealing with international politics. Historically, Tashik and Yazir are the closest to the Azish throne. The stereotype of the Azish is that they are peaceful, prefer education to war, and adore the bureaucracy and paperwork. The Azish themselves consider the latter a point of pride, as the structure of their government has for many centuries prevented any major internal crisis. They are, however, focused on being respectful and polite. In Azir, one should not raise their voice when talking, and should always remain calm even when angry. Particular care is taken never to offend a guest, though this does not mean the Azish can be pushed around. As a result, they are known for talking around the matter a lot when disagreeing with something, and never saying no outright. The Azish government is a bureaucracy, composed of several levels of scribes. One may join the public servant caste by passing a written exam. Though the test is nominally open to all citizens, it's difficult and usually requires expensive formal education. Most government officials are therefore people whose social status was already high. The highest ranking members of the government, other than the prime akasiks, are the viziers. They serve as advisors to the prime, with enough political pull to force their decisions on them and are responsible for selecting a new prime following the death of the previous through an application review process. Their high status and broad knowledge means that each prime will often be a former vizier, as they can make their applications the most convincing. The elected ruler of the Azish Empire bears the title of Prime Akasix. Their symbol of power is a traditional hat with sweeping sides called the Imperial Yuana Zixin. The Azish believe that they are never without a prime. When a prime dies, the election of a new one is considered as a search for the person who is and always has been a prime. Any person, except for religious leaders known as scions, can apply for the position. However, the process requires many forms and essays, which are reviewed by the viziers. The Azish pride themselves on this method as it avoids succession wars. The prime is considered to belong to the public. Citizens can enter a lottery to watch the prime sleep, eat, and perform other daily tasks. They can also collect and keep relics of the prime, such as a nail clipping or a strand of hair. When the Prime issues a mandate to the public, citizens have one month to make the grievances known, before being forced to comply. These grievances are often displayed as logical arguments and protests. The Azish do not divide their population into light eyes and dark eyes. In the foreign countries, it is speculated that this is because there aren't enough pale-eyed Azish to form a self-sustainable social caste. Rather, the Azish social hierarchy is based on education and elevation through the bureaucratic government system. Viziers and scribes are among the highest ranking members of society. Scribes are stratified by level and then circle, with a person's particular rank being indicated by patterns on their clothing. Regular citizens who are not members of the government are known as discreet. Order in the country is kept by traveling law keepers called constables. Constables typically wear black uniforms with a double row of silver buttons in the front and thick gloves along with collars. They seem to have the authority to capture, try and even execute criminals. However, they cannot act against the viziers and are not allowed to requisition the imperial shard blades. Lying on the western side of continental Roshar, Shinovar is bordered to the east by the Misted Mountains and to the west by an unnamed mountain range. Multiple rivers flow through Shinovar from the bodies of water to both the north and south. The Misted Mountains prevent Shinovar from bordering any other nations. The mountains also protect Shinovar from the worst of the high storms, so Shinovar experiences far more mild high storms than the rest of Roshar. Regular storms also occur in Shinovar, particularly during the summer, and it can be difficult to tell the two apart based on strength. The high storm still recharges gems with the same amount of stormlight despite its lower strength. The Shin, natives of Shinovar, have round faces and are one of the few ethnicities on Roshar whose eyes lack epicanthic folds. These features give them a wide-eyed look that, to outsiders, makes them appear to resemble young children. The Shin also have lighter skin than people in other parts of Roshar, and are often described as pale. The average Shin is shorter than the average Alethi. Their distinctive features are the result of them being xenophobic and not intermixing with the other races very much. 
Shinovar has a vastly different ecology from the rest of the planet, as the flora and fauna there have not the need of adapting to survival in the high storms. Much of the ecology there is based on the plants and animals brought to Roshar by the Ashen refugees. The ground in Shinovar is coated with a layer of soil, making the ground feel springy to outsiders. The entire land is coated with a thick layer of grass that does not move or react to movement. The trees dotting the landscape are straight upward with leaves that do not withdraw into the trunk. Plants that are known to be farmed in Shinovar include wheat, strawberries and grapes. Animals that live in Shinovar include chickens and horses. Horses in Shinovar are both domesticated and wild. When humans first arrived on Roshar from Ashen, the singers gave them the land of Shinovar to settle in. Because it is sheltered from high storms, humans were able to grow the plants and animals they brought with them there. Humans, however, decided to expand from the land they were given. During the Silver Kingdoms, Shinovar was known as Shin Kaknish. Noadon claims to have been in a war near the Shin border. Shinovar seems to have been less isolationist then, as they had a working Oathgate and Shin people among the Knights Radiant. After the desolation, the Shin took control of the Honor Blades and brought them to Shinovar, save for Talm's Blade, as it was with him on Braes. Because of this history, they consider themselves the only ones who remember the truth about Rasharan history, though what they remember might not be entirely accurate. Nail came back and retrieved his at some point without informing the Shin leaders. Members of the Shin used and trained with the Honor Blades and Surges. During the Era of Solitude, the Shin tried multiple times to conquer all of Roshar, but they did not succeed at any time. They used Honor Blades, Surges and Cavalry, a fighting technique unfamiliar to the rest of the continent. The way Shinovar is governed does not seem to be well known outside of Shinovar, even to other monarchs like Teravangian. Other countries tend to view them as barbarians. When it comes to foreign policy, the Shen tend to be very isolationist, declining to join Dalinar's coalition of countries when the Everstorm hit. This policy is due to their xenophobic nature. The Shin leaders are involved in making someone truthless. As the Stone Shamans are also involved in monitoring the truthless, it is possible they are part of the Shin leadership. The Shin have a distinct naming scheme, seemingly unique to their culture. A person is identified first by their given name, then as either son or daughter, and finally their parent, father for men, possibly mother for women. As such, Shin would have a name like Thresh Son Esan, Thresh, son of Esan, or Ali, daughter Hazweth, Ali, daughter of Hazweth. In extraordinary circumstances, one can use the name of the grandparent instead, so as to avoid dishonoring their parent. One example of such a case is Zeth, son, son Valano, meaning Zeth, son of the son of Valano. The name pattern is applied to the names of heralds in the Shin culture, with honor being considered their parent. Nail is known as Nin, son, god. The Shin have an extremely strict social structure based on profession. High on the social ladder in Shinovar are the farmers, who add to the land by growing plants and are as such considered holy. Each farmer is given the title of he who adds and is referred to as such by other Shin. Farmers spend their days either working their fields or exercising their power to oversee negotiations, during which they wear fine multicolored robes that tie into the front. The robes seem designed for horseback riding, as the robes reach almost to the ground from horseback. Farmers are able to own and trade warriors by way of stones similar to oath stones. Because of their holy nature, outsiders are not allowed to visit farming villages or farmland. Warriors are all viewed extremely poorly in Shin culture. To a Shin, since warriors exist only to destroy, they are far below the farmers and craftsmen who live to create, and even merchants who trade in others' goods. All warriors are required to obey totally the person who holds their stone, voluntarily subjecting themselves to a state not unlike slavery. While a Shin warrior is able to distinguish his stone, it does not appear to be remarkable in any other way. Their subjugation appears to be entirely voluntary. As a rule, Shin warriors cannot be given to outsiders, and the rules regarding the training of warriors inside Shinovar are unknown. What is known, however, is that any person who picks up a weapon is required to take a stone and live the rest of their life as a warrior. Warriors are recognizable by the simple brown clothing that they wear. Only the truthless are considered lower than warriors in Shin culture. At present, there is only one Shin truthless, and they are not likely to be any more in the foreseeable future. Truthless are exiled from Shinovar and required to live the life of a Shin warrior outside of Shinovar. 
They are required to have a master, but are not allowed to seek or avoid a particular master, freely sharing information about their servitude to any who asks, assuming that a current master has not given contradictory orders. The precise nature of the offence that makes one truceless is currently unknown. The Shin follow stone shamanism. They believe stone to be sacred and that their soul is given to the stones upon their death, where they continue to exist. They consider walking upon stones to be a heresy and derogatorily refer to those who do as stone walkers. The stones of Urethiru are the one exception to this, as Urethiru is a holy site. Similarly, mining in stone is considered to be a heresy. Because of this, metal is very valuable in Shin territory, with the Shin preferring soul cast metal above mined metal because of the inherent blasphemy in obtaining the latter. Thank you very much for watching. I sincerely appreciate all your time and attention. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like since that's one of the biggest metrics that YouTube looks at when recommending it. And if you'd like to see more, please hit the subscribe button so that you could be notified of future videos. Take care and we'll talk again very soon.